For the Future is here, everybody. Oh my gosh, did you see that episode? That was such a good episode. Oh my goodness. There's a lot that happened, but it's also like the perfect lead-in to the next episode. This, this is a really, really well done episode. Like, oh my gosh, just, just overview thoughts. It gets a lot of the, I guess I should say, emotional baggage that a lot of the characters are struggling with. Uh, it gets that done. That way when they have to finish the series with the final episode, they can, you know, go all out. Cause there's, <laughs> dude, there, there's a lot that happened. Like every single character I feel has something important to do. And although the episode did leak, I was lucky in that I only got spoiled in one thing. I was spoiled that Lucius Palisman became a snake shifter because thousands of you kept commenting on it, on my videos. It was really annoying. You guys kept dropping spoilers and I had to keep deleting them. Thank goodness, uh, most people only really dropped the Palisman spoiler. I didn't really see any other spoilers. And if I did, I probably just didn't bother reading them. So I was lucky in that that was the only thing I got spoiled for. Still sucks that that was what I got spoiled for, but hey, you know what? It is what it is. Anyway, as we always do, let's go through the plot and talk about this freaking episode. So it begins uh, right after King's Tide, similar to Thanks to Them, where we see what happens, except this time on the Boiling Isle side. We see the Collector Dragon King up towards him, and they start talking about how they're gonna start playing the Owl House. Lilith and Hootie, we got the Hootie Copter back, which is awesome. That duo tries to rescue King, but unfortunately the Collector turns them into these little puppet things, or like marionettes, which is a common theme that happens throughout this episode. You'll, you'll see that later. And now the Collector is being very rowdy, shooting like star beams out all over the place and everybody's like running in terror. And King, this is another common thing about the episode, King is trying to keep the Collector in check by being quote unquote his pal, his best friend. King is sort of trying to keep the Collector in check so that they don't destroy the Boiling Isles. By doing this, he says, hey, let's play a game, the Owl House. It's pretty simple, honestly. It's literally just like, let's pray pretend. They don't even need an Owl House. The Collector's like, we're gonna need an Owl House. And then like, that's never brought up again, which is weird. I guess the Collector makes a new castle. So I guess that's their Owl House. I don't know. That, that That's fine. So the Collector then asks King what his role is supposed to be in all of this. Uh, while that's happening, we get to meet up with Ida and Rain, and we see that they are safe, which is very good. And Ida takes notice of King and the Collector, and she transforms into Harpy Ida to try and fly up and rescue King. At the same time, Kikimora is also coming out from underneath the Titan Skull, and we see that she's still, you know, around here someplace. And also at the same time, we see a bunch of uh, social media updates uh, with a bunch of people posting pictures of what's happening to the world. And it's basically just the Collector and the Collector's little star robot? things it's not really clear these just like serve as the collector they're just like little stars that are basically doing his will transforming people into these marionette puppet things i'll just call them toys because that's what they call them in the episode but then of course the owl beast starts becoming too much for her and she tries to pull out her elixir which she has hardly any of left the collector then takes notice of this and grabs the elixir shoves it down and says hey you look fun want to play to which Ida then becomes completely transformed by the Owl Beast. And from there, we are shown our cool logo that transforms into a collector themed logo, which honestly looks pretty sick. After that, we cut back to Luce and her squad. Uh, Luce is chilling in the in between realm, sitting in between, you know, Earth and the Boiling Isles. Uh, at this time, she sees a mysterious figure, which honestly, I can't really tell who it is. It looks like somebody with wings? Some sort of demon? It could be a titan or something? I don't know. Before Luz can get a good look at this mysterious person though, she is dragged out of the in-between by Amity so that the whole squad can get over to the other side. At this time, we see the hunter is in quite the bad mood. He's complaining about Belos and how the others are scared that Belos is like a taboo, like, oh no, you can't say his name. He's clearly very frustrated and still upset about, you know, what just happened with poor Flapjack. After that, the party makes their way toward the woods and then Willow touches some grass, which I feel like a lot of us should go outside and do. And she gets a bit sentimental to which Hunter again expresses his frustrations at the fact that they're going way too slow and they need to hurry up because Bellos is probably already on his way to the collector. Everybody's clearly on edge, but Willow, being the emotional rock of the team, reminds everybody that, you know, things will be okay. They're gonna go punch Bellos straight through the face and, you know, come out on top. Gus then comments that, hey, Willow, I'm glad you're always looking out for us. And she says that, oh, well, someone has to. And once she sees that Gus is no longer too much on edge, she uses her powers and kind of uh, goes on down the path. And I really like this. Her using her powers here serves two different purposes. Uh, one is to show that, one, she's powerful, I guess. She has, you know, a pretty good control over her magic. 
in this state as of right now. And two, it transitions to Camila commenting on how, wow, you guys really were holding back in the human realm. And we see Amity starts messing around with some slime, some abomination slime. And Camila starts commenting more about the world, mainly trying to say nice things about the Boiling Isles. They then come up upon the Titan Skull, which we saw in that sneak peek clip, where the entire team is freaking out over the new collector land, I guess I should say. I don't really know what to call it, but there's just stars everywhere. Everything is all like purple and these stars are flying around. And there's that big old castle, the Owl House. I don't know what to call it. The castle of the collector, let's just call it that. And it's above the Titan. And you can see the Titan is still like destroyed because that castle was literally made out of the Titan. It's kind of creepy, but well, I guess they're standing on the Titan all the time anyway, so it's not really that much more creepy, whatever. Camila continues with her positive comments, and Luce catches on that her mother's trying too hard to make it seem like, oh, I like this place, maybe you could stay here, you know? And she expresses that she hasn't changed her mind about what she wanted to do and thanks to them. She still thinks that her mistakes are causing everybody too much trouble, and that she thinks she would be better off if she didn't get involved after they rescue Ida and King. And with that said, then they continue onward. And then in the next scene, this is one that I was literally popping off over, dude. We see that Bellos is like extremely goopy, dude, even goopier than normal. And as he's making his way to the Titan Skull, uh, his body is like falling apart and he sees the ghost of Caleb, which I was like, there's no way, dude, they actually did this. They literally, oh my gosh, it gets even worse, dude. All the Bellows content in this episode is actually top tier. Uh, so he gets super mad about seeing the ghost of Caleb and blames like, hey, this is all your fault. And he tries to attack the ghost of Caleb. When he does that, his body literally starts falling apart. You can like see his freaking bones, dude. It is creepy as heck. After that, he says this. I need a new body. I need a new body, dude. He's going to make another Grimwalker. At least that's what I thought at the time. I was like, oh my gosh, dude. That scene, I was popping off over that scene. We then get back to Luce and her friends, and they meet up at the Owl House, which we already kind of talked about in that sneak peek clip where it had a bunch of vandalized, silly words on it. And the gang make their way inside, Hunter's outside, just pacing back and forth, clearly still very on edge about Bellos. while the rest of them are inside, and Camila is clearly very worried about Luce, and she confides in Willow and Gus that she doesn't really know how to deal with Luce because Luce is forcing herself to be sad, which I thought was a really good line. She literally is forcing herself to be sad as like a self-punishment to help herself like stay away and like not get involved with uh, this situation any further. Gus and Willow then share their funny stories about how they failed in the past and that it's only natural. And Gus's stories about how he like failed a test and he was really worried, not so much about just failing the test, but failing his parents because of like what was expected of him. And that was what scared him more. Once he thinks about his parents though, Gus then starts breaking down in tears and Willow starts comforting him. And it, it's a very emotional moment. It's a really nice scene, honestly. I really like this because the, the writers are so good because they like make everything like perfectly transition to like the next step. Uh, at this point, we see Hunter getting really upset about the palacemen that keep following him around. He's clearly very sensitive around palacemen. And he's obviously still worried about Bellows so that he's like, he's getting nervous at like twigs that he hears out in the forest. Gus and Willow then try to go head out to help him, but before that, Camila stops Willow and asks, hey, are you alright? To which Willow goes, oh, I'm fine. I'm the reliable one in the group. You don't need to worry about me. And then Camila, I, I feel like this is really good because she can kind of read people a little better. You know, being a mother, I feel like she can understand children a little bit better. Uh, and she knows that Willow is probably hiding something, and clearly she is, because we start to see Willow as she walks away. These plants start growing up from her footprints, which is a bit interesting. That's not really happened before with Willow. The next scene is one that we saw in the very first sneak peek of the episode, which is Amity walking down the hallway and coming up to Luce, who's chilling in the nest with her palisman egg, hoping that it could maybe help hatch it. Although Luce says it's just not working. Amity responds by saying, hey, the Bat Queen said the best way to form a connection is to tell the palisman your deepest wish. Luce then asks how Amity connected with her palisman ghost, and she reveals that she tried to make her wish be, I want to be a good witch or whatever, but instead she figured out that, hey, I just want to choose my own life, to be like the captain of my own ship or whatever. And like, that was all that it, that was, all that it was. It was as simple as that. You know, your greatest wish can be something so simple, which I thought was really cool. It was like, it doesn't have to be some grand thing. It can literally just be something so small. 
which works in later in the episode, which is really cool. Amity also comments that she knows that this isn't the only reason that Luce is uh, in the nest, to which she shows Luce the photo that she picked up with a very nice photo of uh, the entire Owl House gang. Hootie especially looks absolutely beautiful in this picture. To this, Luce responds, I'll find Eden and King. And then Hunter from outside goes, hey, look, it's Eden and King. They're on that freaking Kirby Air Ride Warp Star. <laughs> Let's go get them. <laughs> It's pretty funny. So they run on into town and they see a huge wave of sparkles come on through, which you saw from another sneak peek where Hunter's like, uh, oh, something's coming. It's sparkles. And this huge just blast of sparkles passes on through. And we actually see that everybody in there has been transformed into the weird toy things. After that, a very strange looking owl beast comes on through, assumed to be Ida. And the collector comes on in down on the star and is ready to stop the owl beast. And we see King is behind supporting the Collector as well. Then the Collector basically says, Light Glyph, go! And that defeats the Owl Beast. Quote unquote Owl Beast, which turns out to just be Terra in a freaking suit, which was <laughs> so dumb, dude. When I saw this, I cracked up so hard. <laughs> Terra! Ew! Because she's just like does not fit it at all like she cannot be Ida even the collector's like dude you're not Ida Ida's more like a cool ant or whatever and not like just some cringe loser like you Tara oh it's so funny and Tara's sharp tongue then starts getting her into trouble to which the collector does not appreciate and they turn her into one of the toys King then says, hey, Collector, you can't just be doing that to people. To which the Collector responds, oh, you're boring. I'm just playing pretend. Let me get this interaction here. Even playing pretend has consequences. A cranky old witch taught me that. You mean Ida, right? I feel like those lines are pretty important because we see that King is, again, trying to keep the Collector in check. While the Collector is not very considerate about how their powers are affecting other people. And since the Collector wants to play with the real Ida, King's like, oh, well, I can go check to see if she's feeling better because she's supposed to be in her Owl Beast form right now. So they pinky promise once again and head on out of there. And once they do, it transforms the entire town back to normal. And Lucy immediately notices that that kind of hit a little too close to home for her. The Collector is basically role-playing as her in a way. Because King told the Collector the stories of, like, all their adventures. So the Collector is basically taking Luce's place as the main character of the show, which is honestly pretty funny. At least that's how they're playing pretend. Then when the group sees that the Collector flies up back toward the castle, they realize that's where they have to go. But are interrupted by my boy, Mathala Mule, shows up and says, you'll never make it up there. That's when we see the entire Hexide squad. And the next scene, Mathalamu then explains to everybody what happened to the Hexide squad on the Day of Unity, what happened to Bump and all them. And once the Collector appeared, the Grudgeby team uh, sacrificed themselves to keep Basha safe. And all the adults that were trying to defend all the students, they got turned into the toys and were taken away by the Collector. During this time, Mathalamule also went through some personal growth and has decided to become man Mule. To man Mule. Shut up. Bro, you're so cringe. <laughs> Which I was literally cracking up so much about because he's so cringe and he's a stupid little gremlin, but I also love him so much and he's so funny and he's honestly kind of one of my favorite side characters. So, <laughs> dude, I love Mythology, I'm sorry. He's just so funny. So the rest of the team makes their way toward Hexide. And it's really funny because there's like a lot of really funny things that you can read in the background, such as like, uh, no non-puppets inside or like, Days since last major injury, zero. It's like, there's so many little things just written around here. And it's just so funny to pay attention to the background details. I won't go over all of them, but you know, keep your eye out for them when you watch the episode because they're just so funny. So when they walk into Hexide, they basically are calling this place New Hexide, to which we can see it's basically an anarchy. It's just chaos is literally everywhere, but at least they're safe. They even have this amazing Principal Bump statue, which again, I popped off over. I'm just popping off over Principal Bump, Mythalamule, like all these freaking side characters in memory of the coolest principal ever, Principal Bump, AKA Princey B, dude. I literally thought this was so funny, dude. I actually died. I was literally dying, dude. I'm sorry, it's so funny. The Hexide Squad then starts reuniting with some of their pals, uh, which is pretty cool. Gus and Willow start talking to some people and we even see the Blight Twins are okay. Well, okay is one way to put it. Emra seems fine, but Edric is, um, uh, he's, um, Ed. Amity! What happened to you? Uh, what? <laughs> what happened to you, Edric? He fell down a well and, and it was all because he was trying to run away. That's, 
<laughs> it's so pathetic, but it's perfect for Ed. Regardless, the siblings get a nice reunion, which is fun to see. And then we find out through the intercom that Basha is actually the person running New Hexide, which is pretty cringe. Attention! Would Captain Tholomule escort his guests to the council chamber? Has Tholomule been your last name this whole time? And yeah, that's so weird interaction. Your last name has been Tholomule this whole time? And he's just like, yeah. Literally, his last name is Tholomew. There's no way. Does that mean Steve's last name is also Tholomew? So it's Steve Tholomew? That's so stupid, dude. Ah, oh, he's so stupid. And, like, dude, the fact that, like, in every scene, Matholomew literally has the same, like, stupid face. I love his stupid face, dude. Look at He's, like, in every scene he's in, he's got this stupid little gremlin face. Like, that's... I don't know how to explain it, but it's, like, I swear, dude. This face is so funny. I don't know why he always wears this face, but he's just... He's just a little gremlin, and he's great. Uh, enough about Maddie, though. We then move on to the next scene, to which we're back with Bellos, literally dripping, dude. He uses the goop that's dripping from him to form a glyph, to which he enters in the Titan's skull, where we can see all the failed Grimwalkers down at the bottom. All the ghosts of the Grimwalkers appear as well, and Bellos is just like, leave me alone. And he enters in one of his labs, where we can just see all this nasty stuff. We literally even see his leg come off, which is just, ugh, it's disgusting, dude. And when he looks inside all these little chambers, these are basically how the Grimwalkers are made. Like, you see all these tubes and stuff? See all these, like, little specifically lined in beds or whatever? That's a bunch of, like, Grimwalkers that he was working on in the past. And we see that there's a hand sticking out, meaning that there's still one in there. And he tries to possess that one. Oh, it's so gross, dude. It's so gross. Next scene, though, we catch up with the Collector and King flying on back to the castle. And this is also a sneak peek that just released a couple days ago, which is pretty cool. I already saw the scene, so it's pretty funny. Literally, we see Odalia, to which the Collector calls Mama Dahlia. Although, well, the first time I heard it, I thought he said, I'm a doll, yo. I'm a doll, yo. I'm a doll, yo. Anyways, Odalia has these big ambitions that she wants to have made, and the Collector could not care less and instead just wants his pizza bagels and also tells Odalia to clean up his toys. It's it's funny. It's just, she's basically the maid of the Collector, so I don't really, I don't really care about Odalia, whatever. And then uh, the Collector and King make their way into this weird chamber that's like a planet with a couple beds on it, which is this their bedroom, basically. The Collector is then eager to move on to a different game called Capture the Flag, where, where it'd literally be them and King versus like everybody else and then the collector would send them the moon or whatever and King's like oh that's an idea how would they breathe it's like they can just hold their breath it's it's whatever we can just again see that the collector has no way of knowing what mortals are like really even earlier they were asking hey what do mortals like eating it was like rocks gravity what do they eat it's like it was so weird even King was just like bruh <laughs> It's funny, but uh, anyway, the collector's like, Hey, King, can you read me a story? And then they pull out this giant freaking book. And then King starts reading through this book, and it sort of tells about the collector lore. And I'll let him do the reading. Collectors live long, we watch things pass. To preserve, to observe, we must amass. What flies, what swims, be predator or prey. Seal them up so that they never fade. So that's a bit of a collector lore there, which is basically saying, we're gods. Then we have the final passage, which the collector crossed out. Uh, it originally says, but should they meddle in our affairs, we'll clean the planet and scorch the air. Because this is a book made by collectors, and they're talking about mortals. So if mortals meddle in their affairs, they'll clean the planet and scorch the air. Which I can only imagine means they're just going to burn the planet down if the mortals get into their business, which is a bit strange. But instead, the collector fixed it, quote unquote, by saying, but playing is more fun, make friends instead, and the others stink, boo. Which honestly is like a good thing, because there are other collectors out there, according to this passage. Like there's gotta be more, there's gotta be a lot more. But the collector here is just a child. So I feel like it's almost better that the collector is a child because it helps them out. I really, I feel like I need more time to digest this past exactly. I feel like I could talk about this in a future video. Anyways, the collector then starts getting sleepy and asks if he can sleep with Francois, to which King's like, oh, I only let one other person sleep with Francois. And you know how special they are. And the collector gets a bit upset that they know that they're not number one in King's heart. Can you at least leave him to watch over me? I don't like being alone. He puts Francois next to him anyway, so that Francois can watch over the Collector while they sleep. While this happens, we see King leave the chamber, which is a bit interesting, because he's not exactly under constant surveillance, as we all thought. We then get back to New Hexide, where we see Basha and sitting in this throne, where she's basically in charge of the whole place, with these two new characters named Mickey and Roga. We'll get to more of those later, but either way, Mickey is basically constantly 
taking all the ideas that people have for making new Hexide better and saying that, no, we don't need that instead, let's just do our own thing. And it's pretty dumb, and anybody who ends up disobeying them gets thrown inside the detention pit. Loose comments that, well, now that they know that they can't really get help from New Hexide, what they can do instead is teleport directly into the Titan's skull, which is something that she saw Philip do, which is pretty cool, honestly. We then get back to King walking around, and he grabs the hoodie toy that Odali is trying to mess with, and he carries it back to all the other uh, toys, or I guess the coven heads. All the coven heads are like in this row. Uh, we actually saw a quick scene of this as well, where I couldn't exactly tell what was happening in this scene, but when Ida steps over a certain line, all the coven heads start to attack, so I'm guessing they're basically security to keep out anybody who tries to step inside the castle. However, instead of in intruding, Ida just turned out to be pretending uh, to be among the toys, so that she could like fool the collector or whatever, and because uh, she just wanted to see Rain. And it's honestly pretty nice to see Ida. Her redesign is really cool, like her hair has been cut a little bit more. The arm is obviously a thing. I don't know. She looks good. She looks like she's got a good new design. The two then make their way outside while Odalia dragging the toys has a strange idea, which will come into play later. Uh, the two meet up with Lilith, who actually looks quite different as well. They both cut their hair, and Lilith no longer has her uh, hair color. Is it blue or was it purple? I don't actually know. It was like dark blue, right? I don't actually know. I'm colorblind. But we see that Lilith is making a potion that uh, takes all the Albies feathers away, which is pretty nice to see that they're working on keeping the curse at bay still. And then King gives the Hootie toy to Lilith to which she starts freaking out over and Hootie can actually speak, which is weird. I don't know, it's weird, but it's a nice scene that they get to reunite. We then get this scene between Ida and King. I just miss Luce. Well, I miss her too, kiddo. But she's in the human room now with, you know, her real family. Don't say it like that. You know you don't mean it. It's a nice scene, and even Lilith's like, what Ida means to say is that she's at least glad that Luce is safe and not anywhere near here, and then it cuts and turns out they're somewhere near here. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Mytholomew then takes the gang into this secret office, which is basically an anti-Basha office, I'm guessing. It's like where they do all their stuff that's not with Basha and come up with all their ideas. Willow sees a bunch of pictures, and there's even one with Hunter and Flapjack, which is truly adorable. And Mytholomew turns out to have some pretty good ideas for leading the people. And uh, it's so funny that it's just like, with Mytholomew's track record, you'd think he'd be trash, but it turns out he actually has like lots of good ideas, which is just so funny. But if you recognize this room, this is back in like the season one episode where they went inside Willow's mind. It's like that room where all her pictures were shown up. And that's exactly what they're gonna do for Luce. They're gonna pull it out so they can visually look at the glyph from the picture. It's pretty cool, honestly. It's like such a cool idea that they bring this back. After this scene, we see that the body rises up from the ground, but then immediately starts falling apart, to which Bellos is uh, very upset about, and basically it means the Grimwalker wasn't complete, it was not finished. So instead, he has to find somebody to possess. So then Bellos works his way all the way up to the castle, and sees that Odalia is like making Rain put away all the freaking dolls instead of her. She's basically just having the toys do the work for her. She's super upset about it, and then Bellos, looking as menacing as possible, comes up from behind her, and since Odalia was commenting about wanting to be useful, Bella says, oh, I have a use for you. Odalia turns around and goes, me? But no, Bella didn't want Odalia. I mean, I wouldn't either, who would? But instead, goes for Rain. And since Rain is basically defenseless, that's a free body to possess. And that is the new possessed person, Rain. Oh, dude. I didn't think, I didn't think Bella would go for them. It's crazy, dude. Bella possesses Rain. Like, oh my gosh, that's just so crazy. We then get back to the Hexide gang where Willow gives a picture of Hunter with Flapjack to Hunter to try to cheer him up a little bit. After he sees the picture, Hunter sort of gets really sentimental and sad looking. Luce is like, Hunter, are you okay? What's wrong? I don't know. And Willow starts visually becoming anxious, which is not something we see her do too often. She's been bottling up this whole time, but hasn't wanted to tell anybody because she's the reliable one. So she tries to walk out of the room to contain herself. We also see that her powers are starting to get a little bit out of control. Gus also reveals to Hunter that he knew he was a Grimwalker this whole time, which obviously we knew that he knew because he saw it in Bellus's memories back on the Day of Unity. When we get to Willow outside of the room, she's confronted by Basha. Basha then nags her about what it means to keep a team together. And it's like, oh, when you start showing weakness, the whole team falls apart. Uh, if you want my advice, and when she starts hearing this, Willow is just... It, it, it sets her off. Or Willow's already struggling to keep everything bottled up. But after Basha starts nagging her, Willow starts exploding and getting super mad at her. And we can see that her powers are starting to 
get a little bit out of control. Her eyes are doing that like green thing when she uses her powers. While Willow is upset, this happens. Actually, I was gonna advise you to watch your back. You never know when your opponent is gonna strike. Yeah, so since Basha found out that Luce and the others were trying to basically fight back against the Collector, they knew that that would put them at risk of getting caught by the Collector, and they don't want that. They wanna keep themselves safe. So now they're gonna try and stop them. Mickey and this creature then busts on in, and it is revealed that this person Turns out to be Kiki Mora, and I'm honestly mad at myself that I didn't catch on to this. I should have known. I saw like that silhouette, and I was like, hey, that silhouette kind of looks like a robot. And that little character, I was like, that's like a little gremlin character. But then the second one they burst through the wall, I was like, that's Kiki Mora. That's going to be Kiki Mora. I was like, Kiki Mora hasn't shown up in this episode at all. Where is she? I knew it was going to be Kiki Mora the second she burst through the wall. And what's so weird is we get to like see her mouth move. Like we get to see her physically talk with her mouth, which is so like weird because you don't really get to see that too often and now seeing it like i feel like it's just like natural but it, it's so like uncanny valley i guess i don't know that's not the right word but it's so weird seeing her like move her lips and her mouth i just don't know i guess i'm just not used to it it's just it's so weird to me Regardless, Basha and Kikimura use a sleeping potion and throw the rest of the squad inside the detention monster thing. We then get back to Rain Lose or Be Belain? I don't know what to say. Co possessed Rain Bellos. Bellos inside Rain puppet thing? I'll just say Bellos Rain. I don't know. Bellos Rain makes their way into the chamber to sneak up to the collector. Once they do, this happens. So the Collector's got some schmoves, you know, you can't sneak up on the Collector that easily. Uh, anyway, Bellos Rain comments that the spell is not broken as the moon is still on the forehead, but the Collector is not aware that Bellos can possess people, at least I'm pretty sure. And we see that Bellos is very fast on his feet and immediately tries to win the Collector's trust by saying, Collector, you're in danger. In the next scene, we see the entire gang falling into the detention pit, where Kikimura also jumps on into the detention pit to just try and beat them up because she's a loser. We even see that Basha is not like super into this plan. It's mainly just Kikimura. So the entire gang starts fighting back against Kikimura. They get separated. Lucy and her mother go one way. Amity and Matholomew go to another. Basha then confronts Amity and Matholomew and confides that she wants Amity to come back because Amity left the Grudgeby team, left their friend group, and Lily left the Boiling Isles, and she literally just wants Amity back as like a pal. After they duke it out for a bit, and Matholomew pulls off some awesome illusion spells that he learned from Gus, Amity reveals to Basha that she can't be the person she wants. And I feel like this is pretty good for Amity's character. It's basically Amity reaffirming that she is going to choose her own way, like she said earlier in the episode. She wants to be her own person, not the person other people want her to be. I feel like it's that was like the point of this whole scene, is that she's like kind of just, hey, I am myself, I'm not gonna be someone I'm not. We then meet up with Hunter waking up an unconscious Gus inside the detention pit as well. They were also thrown on in here. And before anything else, I just wanna comment quickly that I know it's the detention pit and it's just a bunch of eyeballs, but when I first saw this, I was like, yo, those eyeballs kinda look like uh, Golden Guard masks. I don't know if that was intentional or not. It doesn't really feel like it should be, but honestly, that was the first thing I thought when I saw all that. Anyway, the two of them try to go and beat up Kikimura and the rest but then find out that Willow's powers are going completely out of control. We see her glowing eyes, and she's trying to tell everybody that, hey, I'm fine, nothing's wrong. Clearly, she cannot control her powers, and instead wrap up Hunter and Gus inside of these vines. The next scene cuts back to the Collector completely laughing at what Bellos Rain said about uh, the Collector being in danger. Bellos Rain then doubles down by saying, no, this person is planning their betrayal right now. Collector's like, you don't mean King, do you? He and I are best friends. Then by asking one question, Bellos Rain puts the seed of doubt inside the Collector by saying, where is he now? And then we see a nervous Collector look at Francois like, oh, where is he now? So the Collector then uses their eyes to spy on King, and they overhear that he's met up with Ida and Lilith. And they're discussing that Titan magic basically counters Collector magic because they're looking for ways to defeat the Collector. Lilith then comments about how she wants to trap the Collector again, perhaps, and King's like, no, we can't do that. When the Collector hears that, he seems pretty happy and says, oh, hey, my friend doesn't want to betray me. But then King goes, we need a more permanent method. We need to stop the Collector for good. Then when the Collector finds out about that, this is what happens. That didn't sound very friendly. You know, the human is here too. Close, where's she back? Obviously to help King put an end to you and your little games. After Bellos Rain says that, the Collector gets upset and goes, no, 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 you're fibbing. You've got to be fibbing, right? To which we see a menacing smile come from Bellos Rain. 
I, it feels so weird saying that, but literally, dude. Oh, it's so bad. And it sucks because if the collector just listened for a little while longer, they would have known that what King's permanent solution was literally to just convince the collector by talking to him. That was it. Not to defeat him, not to destroy him, but to just try and talk to him and convince him that these things aren't right. Like a, a mortal to a semi-immortal discussion, as King puts it. And that's honestly pretty sad. It's because King, after befriending the collector, I feel like almost, I shouldn't say enjoyed his time entirely, but like knows that the collector isn't bad. He knows that he's just a young kid. Because the collector likes playing games, but is also just scared of being alone and sad. The collector is literally not like other collectors. They are literally built different. King even feels that he can relate to the collector in some ways. And then when Ida hears King talk about all that, she gives him a hug and says, "Oh, you're growing up so fast, which is nice because like King is honestly being pretty mature about all this. We then get back to the fight with Kikimura chasing after Luce and Camila. They run away using that invisibility glyph and Luce starts freaking out and throws her hat away, which is good symbolism because she feels like she's not worthy of the hat. She doesn't want to be a witch. She can't wear the hat if she's not a real witch. You know, stuff like that. And she's super upset about her failures. And thank goodness Camila is there because she is the one who can support her daughter. And she lets her know that mistakes are a part of life. It's just what's gonna happen. You can't go through life without making mistakes. She starts sharing some of her own mistakes that she made with Luce, uh, just some silly ones. And then leading up to moving to Gravesfield uh, to try and get that new hospital for Manny, Luce's dad. And she was like, well, you know how that turned out. She then shares that one of her biggest mistakes was trying to change her own daughter. She makes like some weird cosmic frontier reference about how you should stand up for your family and, you know, nurture what makes them different. Don't try and make them change. And upon hearing this, Luce is like, Mama, you were a nerd too? You were a nerdy kid? It's pretty sweet. And then Camila says this. My biggest mistake was trying to protect you by changing this beautiful, good witch into something she wasn't. I think that's such a sweet scene. That's I honestly nearly teared up. It was really sweet. It was such a sweet scene. And I think this is so good for Luce's character because we know back at the very beginning of the show, she wished that her mother could understand her. And she also didn't want her mother to have to worry about her. Like, thanks to them, we saw that like video diary. It's like, well, I don't want my mother to have to worry about me. And then once Camila says this to her, she finally realizes. The only thing I've ever really wanted was to be understood was to be understood. It's so nice. That feels like the peak. That was it right there. This screenshot, that is the peak, right? And this is the apex of Luce's character development. And we've, we've gone on the top of the hero's journey. We finally made it to the end. And now all she has to do is finish the job. I don't know, that felt so good. That was it. This one, this one scene, ah, oh, I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. It's so good, literally so good. All she wanted was just to be understood. And being understood by her own mother, I think, was just so important. Ah, oh, it's such a good scene. It's such a good scene. I'm honestly getting a bit choked up. As she says this, though, the palisman hatches. Finally. It finally freaking hatches. And we don't actually get to see what it is at first. It's kind of just like some weird aura that we saw in those sneak peeks. It literally just is a little bit of aura at the very start. So there we go. The palisman has finally hatched. And the next scene, we try and get to the climax of Willow's arc that's happening here, which I really do like this arc. Her powers are once again going out of control and she's self-deprecating and Hunter is able to see all this happening. And then Willow once again calls herself half a witch, to which once Hunter hears this, I saw him glow yellow. And the second I saw that, I was like, dude, it's happening. He has flapjack powers. He literally has the powers that he gets when he used flapjack. He's able to use that warping and rescue Willow from her own magic that was tying her up and lets her know that she's very important to him. That's all he wanted to say. He couldn't really find the words, but just wanted to let her know how important his friends are to him. Gus, while being swallowed by vines, also reassures Willow and says, hey, let it out. Just let us know what's happening. You can tell us, you know? It's important for friends to open up to each other. How many times did Gus open up to Willow? And how many times did Willow open up to Gus? The ratio is very different. That's not always how it should be. Sure, a Willow is an emotionally stable rock, but that doesn't mean she can't break down every once in a while. I don't know. It's just, it's a really nice scene. The detention pit cave thing then starts collapsing thanks to Willow's powers and Hunter uses his awesome flapjack powers grabs Willow grabs Gus and it jumps up and gets him out of there and it's so cool oh it's it's awesome dude I love it that he has the flapjack powers and then Gus and Willow are super excited that wow Hunter you have magic now that's so cool and Hunter's like what what are you talking about what magic I don't have magic and Willow's like you have the magic 
of Flapjack. And it's so sweet because Flapjack is truly living on through Hunter. Even though Flapjack's gone, when Flapjack absorbed into Hunter, Hunter got the magic of Flapjack. I love that so much. After that, they then hear this strange sound coming. Hunter pulls Gus and Willow out of the way once again, and a huge magic blast just comes on through. And we see that Luce is now practicing with her new palisman. She's like, oh, I'm still getting used to this. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, then we see a Kikimora that is also chasing her, and literally the whole team, mainly Willow, Gus, and Hunter, team up against Kikimora, and they're all trying to take her down. Then the entire new Hexide squad comes in. Basha as well, because Basha, again, was kind of iffy about this plan. They all team up and throw a bunch of grudge me balls that are flaming at Kikimura. Literally the whole squad just dog piles onto Kikimura. It's so funny, dude. It's so funny. While that's happening, the rest of the squad runs off and they start drawing up this new glyph to warp to the Titan head. Once they do, they narrowly avoid one final Kikimura blast by warping straight to the skull of the Titan. And they're on some like weird, I don't know. I don't even know what to call this. It's, I don't even know. What is this? I don't know what. It's so weird looking. Is it like an eyeball? It, I don't know. Something of the Titan. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It looks like a moon crater, but also like some sort of mushy thing. I'm not gonna think about it too long. Either way, they're on this thing. The whole group starts celebrating, and then we get the big reveal to Luce's Palisman. And again, this is a thing that I got spoiled on. I luckily only saw a glimpse of what it looked like. I was mainly more of word of mouth because you guys wouldn't stop freaking commenting about it. Jeez. And then I think this is really cool. This is a really cool moment where everybody starts trying to guess what Luce's Palisman is. And it's literally like the most common answers that the fan base always had. Like, and it's 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 good that it all comes from each character too. Like Camila's like, oh, do you think it'll be a dragon? Since Luce played with like a dragon back in like episode one. Uh, Hunter's like a bird, which people may have thought it was gonna be a bird because you know, the owl house, the birds, you know, either all the Clawthorns have birds. So it makes sense for it to be a bird. And it also is nice coming from Hunter because, you know, Flapjack was a bird. Amity's like, oh, you think it's gonna be an otter? Because, you know, Luce had her funny otter costume and she knows the silly side of Luce. So she's like, oh, an otter, that'd be funny. Will then guesses uh, a bat and Gus guesses a snake, which there's various different evidences for those as well. I just like how each character's guess makes it, how, it's like kind of how they would perceive Luce. Not so much perceive Luce, but like, you know, like they each saw that sort of thing in Luce. And it's really neat because it's almost as if Luce is all of these things but like none of them, because she doesn't have to be tied down to just one thing, which is really cool. Which is why the palisman that she has is a snake, but a snake shifter named String Bean, I guess? And it can literally morph into different creatures, which is so cool. So it really does make it so, since that the original creature is a snake, since the Owl House logo has the palisman of the owl, now when you turn the other way, there's the snake with the L and the S. That's so cool, that's such a clever logo design. And now it actually paid off since her talisman is truly a snake. And the little creature is so cute. I literally kept calling it a worm on a string once I first saw it. Even Camila loves all the little talisman. It's so cute. Well, then goes up to Hunter and lets him know that he's very important to her too. And they sort of hold hands. So maybe there's something there. Who knows? We'll have to see maybe in the next episode. But while the gang is like super happy and celebrating, we see a very sad looking collector looking down upon them. Bellows Rain then comes up to the collector and says this. Luce has come to help King get rid of you for good. What will you do, Collector? I think I want to play a new game. That's right, a new game. The final game of the Owl House that is coming in watching and dreaming. And please, please don't be leaked. I don't want this episode to be leaked, dude. This is the final episode of the show. I'm begging you, please don't be leaked, dude. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry if this episode ends up being leaked. But that's about three months away. And that is also for the future. An amazing episode for resolving lots and lots of characters, emotional baggage, and you know, peaking a lot of their character arcs, reaffirming the ones that you've already finished, and having both your villains be like super active in this. Like Bellos is great, the Collector is great. I can't wait to see what happens with like Bellos and the Collector. Oh, it's gonna be so good. And the fact that they're keeping like Rain relevant just through like Bellos possessing them. Oh, it's so good. I can't wait to see what happens to Rain too. I really hope they get freed and do something because I feel like Rain is so underrated. I don't know guys, I, let me know your thoughts. I gotta know, I gotta, there's so much cool stuff with this episode. 
And I want to know what you all think about it, because, oh, it's so exciting, dude. It's so exciting. I'm so excited for the next episode. And this episode was just so good. I'm sure I missed lots of little things. There's so much here, everybody. There's literally so much in this episode. If I wanted to cover it all, this video would just be way too long. And I just can't, I can't go on for that long, but I, know, I already went on long enough. <laughs> But yes, a legendary episode. I'm gonna make so much content about this because, man, it's exciting. I'm so excited for the finale of the Owl House coming soon. And again, let me know what you think. I'm very curious. But either way, thanks so much for watching, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you all later. Bye bye. <laughs>